So last time or last week, we started with, or we started talking about the electrolyte imbalance. And we started with the major electrolytes in the body, talking about sodium, potassium, and we did sodium, we did potassium, we did uh, other electrolytes, both hyper and hypo. So we want to look at calcium, 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 calcium. And today we are saying that uh, in the body, more than 99% of the body's calcium is located in the skeletal system. So we have abundance of calcium, but most of them, almost all are fixed into the skeletal system, talking about the bones, the teeth, and what have you. So we have the bones, the teeth, and what have you. So we have the normal calcium levels is ranging around 8.5 to 10 milligrams per dia. That is the normal calcium level. If you do any electrolyte analysis and calcium is below 8.5, it means you have low calcium level, termed as hypocalcemia. If you do electrolyte analysis and it's more than 10 milligrams per dia, it means it is hypercalcemia. And we need calcium for transmission of nerve impulses. The nerves that they move throughout the body need calcium for its transmission. And we also need calcium for muscle contraction. So calcium is needed for nerve transmission as well as muscle contractions. Well, it means that if one has low calcium level, nerves or the nerves, the nerves are not going to uh, function very well and the muscles are not going to contract very, very well. So we need normal calcium level to enable the muscles and the nerves to function very, very well. So calcium is needed for blood clotting. So apart from nerves and muscle contraction, it, calcium is needed for blood clotting. So before blood can clot, you need some amount of calcium to take into the clotting process. So the clotting process, uh, fibrinogen into fibrin and so on and so forth, or fibrin, fibrin, all these things need calcium. And it is for blood clotting. We also need calcium for teeth and bone formation. For because you can, before you can get a very strong teeth and bone formation, you need normal levels of calcium. To give you. So these are the functions of calcium and also to maintain a normal heart rhythm. The heart beat, which is the labda, labda, is partly maintained by the normal calcium levels. So when the calcium level is disturbed, either hypo or hyper, it means the heartbeat is going to be affected, the bones and the teeth are not going to be well formed. Clot is not going to help. Clotting is going to be prolonged and muscle contraction and nerve contractions are going to be affected. So that is about calcium. So if you look at the hands, you're talking about skeletal muscle there and the teeth. These things contain higher levels of calcium inside the body. Hypocalcemia, serum calcium levels, which is less than 8.5 milli equivalent per liter you are described as hypocalcemia. That is the bottle there. The bottle is the Captain Calcium. It contains high calcium content. So if you have hypocalcemia, you need Captain Calcium to restore calcium inside the body. Causes of hypocalcemia, we have vitamin D and calcium deficiency. So you need vitamin D to give you normal calcium levels. Lack of vitamin D is equated to lack of calcium because before vitamin C can be absor absorbed, then uh, you need, or before calcium can be absorbed, you need vitamin D to aid in calcium absorption. If you don't have adequate vitamin D, you, your calcium will be deficient. Your calcium will be deficient. So you need the presence of vitamin D so you can absorb calcium from the GIT, from food, and from other sources to aid in uh, calcium abundance in the body. 
primary or surgical hyperparathyroidism. So we have primary or uh, surgical hyperparathyroidism. What happens in this scenario? In this scenario, we are talking about the parathyroid gland, which is going to increase its activity. So the activity of parathyroid gland So the parathyroid gland is going to increase its activity and overactivity of the parathyroid gland will lead to uh, hyperparathyroidism, which means that it's going to have more parathyroid hormones in the blood. So primary hyperparathyroidism is a situation where you have more parathyroid hormones in the blood. So what is the function of the parathyroid hormone? The function of the parathyroid hormone is to put calcium from the bones and teeth into the blood and thereby increasing uh, blood calcium levels. But when the parathyroid gland has been surgically removed or operated upon, then the gland is not going to release enough parathyroid hormone to put calcium from the bones and teeth and increase calcium levels into the blood. So it means that there's going to be going to experience calcium deficiency because of parathyroid hormone also being deficient. So in surgical hyperparathyroidism, when the gland has been surgically operated upon and is not releasing adequate parathyroid hormone, the calcium levels are going to be affected because the pulling of calcium from the bones into the blood is also going to be affected severely. We have pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. The pancreas is a hormone that produces, or it's a gland that produces insulin. When it is inflamed, it is called pancreatitis. Now, during pancreatitis, insulin is not going to be produced in the normal amount. So it means deficient production of insulin will be seen in pancreatitis. What happens to the level of glucose in the blood? Blood glucose is going to build up and thereby making the cells going through starvation because you need to push the glucose from the blood into the cells, and this is done by insulin. But during pancreatitis, insulin cannot be produced in the normal amount. So, whatever glucose metabolism that takes place is going to be trapped inside the blood. And therefore, once glucose is trapped inside the blood, the, staff, the cells are going to be <coughs> affected severely. The, 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 the cells are going to be starved. So as I told you earlier on, when the cells start starving, they divide themselves and they go through the process of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. This process we we'll always make sure that calcium and potassium pull out of the cell into the extracellular space. So once this is happening, hello, hello, yes, can hear. Oh, yes, please. Sorry, I was trying to solve something with the IT man. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. okay. All right, so let's let let us continue. So, uh, I think uh, I have explained the hyperparathyroidism, the primary or surgical hyperparathyroidism. If the parathyroid gland has been surgically uh, 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 triggered or has been tampered with, the function is going to be affected. And during vitamin deficiency, there is no vitamin D, and no vitamin D means that. Uh, calcium is also going to be affected. And once calcium is affected, the level of calcium becomes too low because of lack of vitamin D. And this puts pressure on the parathyroid gland to produce more parathyroid hormone. But the parathyroid hormone, once it is triggered and produced an excessive amount, there is no vitamin D to produce the calcium. So lack of vitamin D and lack of calcium 
will lead to hyperparathyroidism because pressure will be put on the parathyroid gland to produce parathyroid hormone. But because of the lack of vitamin D, calcium can still not be produced. So it leads, it is a linkage. Lack of vitamin D will lead to lack of calcium. And lack of calcium means pressure will be put on the parathyroid gland to produce more parathyroid hormone. And any gland that overworks becomes enlarged. So that is the relationship here. In pancreatitis, I made mention of the fact that the pancreas is an organ that produces insulin to pick glucose from the blood, fix them into the cells. So the cellular activity can, can, can go on. And the cellular activity is the metabolism of carbohydrate in the cells to generate energy in the form of ATP. So if the glucose is trapped in the blood, then definitely you are not going to have enough energy inside the cells. And the cells will try to restore energy within them by going through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. This process of rigorous production of energy by crude way will lead to ketone bodies. So ketone bodies are going to be produced. And once ketone bodies are produced, it's going to ginger the release of calcitonin, which is an antagonistic hormone. And the calcitonin is going to mop up the glucose from the blood. So always parathyroid hormone will pull calcium from the bones and make calcium available in the blood. But when pancreatitis occurs and then the process of gluconeogenesis and gluconeogenesis, then definitely there's a release of calcitonin, which is antagonistic hormone. And that calcitonin will mop up glucose, uh, calcium from the blood and fix them back into the bones and teeth. So because of the pancreatitis, Insulin is lacking, glucose is trapped in the blood, the cells divide themselves through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, and the, this process changes the release of calcitonin, and calcitonin picks up glucose and fix them in, picks up calcium and fix it into the bones and the teeth, thereby reducing calcium levels inside the blood. And this leads to hypocalcemia. So renal failure, renal failure. In renal failure, there is lack of vitamin D. And when there's lack of vitamin D, it's going to affect calcium production. And once there's renal failure, there is also increased levels of phosphorus. And once phosphorus increases, there is a reciprocal relationship between phosphorus and calcium. So here, in renal failure patients, they lack vitamin D. And when they lack vitamin D, their yeah, calcium levels are going to be affected. And once calcium level becomes low, there is going to be an increase in phosphorus levels in the blood. So that is how renal failure can lead to hypocalcemia. Anytime there's renal failure, vitamin D is affected and it's affecting calcium levels. So let us look at the clinical manifestations of hypocalcemia. We have tetany and cramps in the muscles of the extremities. So tetany and cramps are available in the muscles of the extremities. So if you look at the extremities, the muscles there, the nerves are not going to function well. We mentioned this at the beginning that the function of the nerve is that it needs calcium to function very, very well. So when there's low calcium level, the nerves are not going to function well. So it's going to experience some sort of tetany among the extremities uh, of the body, the muscles there. So definition is a nervous, that is titanium, is a nervous affection characterized by intermittent tonic spasms that are usually paroxysmal and involve the extremities. So that is the definition for uh, titanium. So that is it. So we have another sign called trisosine. sign. So that's the carpal spasms. So that's the carpal spasms. So when you fix the stethoscope, at the calf over the, uh, the upper arm and start to inflate it, you will see a simultaneous contractions of the hands and then the, 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 the rest. And this is called the carpal spasms. And this sign is an indication that the person is having hypo, hypocalcemia. We call it trasose sign, trasose mm -hmm. sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have another sign called Shivostic sign. Shivostic sign. Shivostic sign. 
So this is a sign that when you strike along the zygomatic arc, there is a simultaneous contraction of the muscles of the cheeks and then the face. If you look at this woman, I assume she is laughing. She's not like it is the twitching of the muscles around that, the buka muscles around the, 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 the mandibles. You see that a simultaneous twitching when you strike the that zygomatic arc. This is called chibosic sign. There is seizure, and the seizure patient is put uh, uh, in the bed with wheels to prevent him from falling. And the mental changes also, they present the brain even needs calcium to function, the nerves need calcium to function. So during hypocalcemia, there could be mental changes and seizure could also set in. So you have to protect the bed patient from falling. Then we have uh, electrical conductivity, and we have the ECG, which shows prolonged QT, QT interval. So the QT intervals are going to be prolonged. And once it's prolonged, it's an indication of hypocalcemia. So you can call it ECG or EKG, it's the same thing. So we have the medical management. You can either go intravenous or per oral calcium carbonate or calcium gluconate. That is the captain calcium. So this man, this man is here. So uh, that is captain calcium. So we have the calcium gluconate. It's a capsule where you can take to restore the blood calcium levels orally. This is taken orally. It is better to replace through the oral route than going through the IV route because we made mention that the IV. <laughs> We make sure that the IV route, you can move from hypo to hyper. So it is better to go through the uh, open oral route than going through the IV route. You will need to encourage increased dietary intake of calcium. Food sources of calcium is available. That is the, uh, the, the, the dairy product, the chicken, the, 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 the milk. These are all good sources of calcium. Once you increase the intake of these, uh, calcium rich food, then the body will be able to absorb in the presence of vitamin D, you have it going to have enough calcium levels in the blood. Then you monitor neurological status. We said the nerves need calcium to function. So during hypocalcemia, there's going to be uh, nerves are going to be affected and the nerves are not going to function very, very well. So you need good calcium for good nervous. Uh, uh, function. So during hypocalcemia, we need to monitor neurological status, see whether the spasms are set, seizures are there or not. Okay, then monitor it. Seizure charts are all needed here. Establish seizure precaution signs, and then the chart can help you to well, establish the frequency at which the seizures are setting in, and raise the bedside rules to prevent the patient from falling. If possible, let the patient on the low bed or on the floor so the patient doesn't injure him or herself. Then we have hypercalcemia. Serum glucose level greater than 10.5 milli equivalent per liter. And this is where we can restore blood calcium level from the bones, from the intestines, from the kidney. The kidney will retain calcium so they are not excreted. And once you eat food sources of calcium, the body will absorb it and increase the blood calcium levels. We are going to have increased absorption of calcium from the bones and increase the blood calcium levels. We are going to uh, increase uh, uh, calcium levels so much in the blood. So hypercalcemia causes, hyperparathyroidism. Here there, when there is an increased thyroid activity, Directly, that thyroid activity is going to lead to increased parathyroid hormone production. And when the parathyroid hormone increases in their production, then it's going to pull calcium from the bones and fix them into the blood. So it's going to increase the blood calcium level. So direct hyperparathyroidism will lead to direct parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone will pull calcium from the bones and increase it into the blood. Prolong immobilization, if you like, in bed so much and you become, for example, bedridden or inability to move around. 
calcium is mobilized from the bones and the teeth and they all move into the blood. So the bones become brittle and weak, which can predispose you to fractures and dislocations. Then we have thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics, definitely once the urine is being produced and is being excreted, calcium is left behind. So now it will spare potassium and also spare calcium. Most of the time, Potassium and calcium behave in a certain direction, the same direction. The direction that potassium goes in the body, you see the same direction, calcium also move into the body. So calcium and potassium, they have similar behavior and similar activity in the body. So during thiazide diuretics, you know, uh, it spares potassium and therefore calcium levels are increased as well as potassium levels. Or like the loop diuretics, where it will not spare potassium. The loop diuretics will deplete potassium and as well as deplete calcium. But the thiazide diuretics will not do that. Large doses of vitamin A and D. These vitamins help in the synthesis of uh, calcium in the blood. So that is what happens. Okay, so uh, we have uh, uh, large dose of vitamin A and D that will lead to, is somebody's hand up? Okay, so that will lead to more production of calcium uh, in the body. And this will lead to high calcium. Like we said vitamin D is going to aid in the production of Right, uh, calcium, and therefore, in the presence of vitamin and D, more calcium is being produced. All right. Clinical manifestations here. We have. We have muscle. Okay, somebody's hand is up. Let's hear you. Uh, please, I wanted to know how the prolonged. Immobilization can cause the hypercalcemia. I do not get that part very well, please. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Prolonged immobilization is going to reduce the activity of uh, calcitonin and increase the activity of parathyroid hormone. So it will pull, it will rather pull uh, calcium from the muscles, the bones, the teeth, and increase it. So you know, once you somebody lies in, the, I don't know whether you have observed this over the period. Once somebody lies in the bed for a long time, you see the legs become small and weak. And this is due to pulling of these ions or minerals from the bones and increase it inside the blood. So uh, by the fact that the person is not in activity, and you have forgotten that I told you that one of the things that strengthens the bone is exercise. You've forgotten about that. And exercise will increase the reabsorption. It will pick the calcium. That is, calcitonin action is increased during exercise, thereby picking calcium from the blood and fixing them inside the bones and teeth, making the bones and teeth stronger during exercise activities or strenuous activities. On the other hand, during a period of immobilization, you have the parathyroid hormone in action which will pull calcium from the bones and teeth and increase it inside the blood, brittling or making the bones and teeth very, very weak and brittle, predisposing them to fractures. I don't know whether I have explained. I'm okay now, you. thank you. 
All right, thank you. Okay. So I think somebody's hand was also up or we can move on. Is that okay? Yes, let's hear you. So, yes. Yes. With the causes of the hypocalcemia, uh, mm -hmm. I read I read a book and yeah, yes. it was also suggesting that uh, hypomagnesemia, uh, hyperpatricemia, alkalosis, hypoalbuminemia, albuminemia can also cause uh, hyper uh, hypocalcemia. Uh, okay. So I I wanted to know if uh, okay, that's uh, fine. Yes. Yes, so that's okay. That's why so many things can cause hypocalcemia. A lot, a lot of things can cause it. If that thing can cause hypokalemia, a lot of things can cause hypokalemia as well as hypocalcemia. They behave the same inside the body. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll, I'll, I'll give you time to ask questions. Write your questions down. So we have a period where we answer all your questions so we can we can move smoothly like those of vitamin a will also uh, cause increased osteoclast activity in the bone leading to rise in calcium levels i told you that in the cast in the blood uh once you have uh calcium vitamin a and vitamin d the activity of calcium in the blood is going to be high and all oh, this can lead to hypercalcemia. Oh, mute your microphone after talking. Eh? Okay, so large dose of vitamin A will increase osteoclast activity and thereby pulling calcium from the bones and teeth into the blood, just like uh, parathyroid hormone will be increased and pull these minerals into the blood, weakening the bones and teeth. So the clinical manifestations here, we have muscle weakness. We said uh, too much of everything is bad. We need calcium for good muscle contraction, but if calcium levels are too much, then the muscles become so weak. You feel nausea, and you feel like vomiting. You have lethargy and you have confusion because you need calcium to give you good nervous functions in the brain. And constipation is also there with hypercalcemia. So there's kind of constipation here. Cardiac arrest can also be uh, seen in hypercalcemia as well as hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia can cause uh, cardiac arrest and also hypercalcemia causing cardiac arrest. In hypercalcemia crisis, the levels moving around 70 mg per DL or higher, that is where you can describe the person as hypercalcemia crisis. And this can lead to cardiac arrest, constipation, lethargy, and confusion. Medical management, we have, uh, if the source of calcium can be seen, eliminate it. So eliminate calcium from the diet, that you take so stop taking dietary products stop taking milk and those foods that are rich in calcium monitor the logical status we said calcium is needed in muscle and nervous function check the caesar precaution signs and check if everything is working well increase fluids iv or peroral so calcitonin uh calcitonin always comes in during hypercalcemia and calcitonin will mobilize calcium from the blood and push it, push it inside the bones and making the bones and teeth stronger. So calcitonin always works to reduce calcium levels in the blood, whilst parathyroid works to increase calcium levels in the blood. Let me hear your questions before I move on to calcitonin. Yes. Yes. Your, yes, let me hear your questions. Okay, yes, uh-huh. Uh, yes, your, yes, your hands are up. Let's hear you. Yes. Uh, 
Your voice, your voice is fading. Let's 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 hear your voice well. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, please, I want to know how hepatal senior can cause constipation. How? Hepatal senior. Hepatal senior to make the muscle, the smooth muscles weak, so it's going to reduce peristalsis. This is direct relationship. Okay. The peristalsis okay. action will be reduced, and the the the, the intestine becomes atonic. Mm -hmm. And Thank therefore, you, constipation. Thank you. This is direct relationship. All right. Okay. So, yes, any other? Okay. There's somebody's hand up. Okay, let's hear you. Yes, we, we want to hear you, please. We want to hear you. You are not talking out then, and then let's move on. I think you are not ready. Okay, so Cassitonin. Okay, used to lower serum calcium levels. I have just mentioned it. Useful for patients with heart diseases or renal failure. That is true. Uh, during uh, heart disease and renal failure, these ions are not in their correct uh, uh, levels. And therefore, you're going to have increased levels of calcium, increased levels of potassium during heart and renal diseases. So the calcitonin is called in action to come and mobilize calcium and other ions from the bones and fix them inside. So it mobilizes and fix, pick these calcium from the blood and fix them inside the bones, thereby reducing calcium levels, reduce bone resorption. So once the calcitonin is fixing calcium into the bones, it's forming the bone and making the bone stronger and healthier. So it reduces bone resorption. Bone resorption is when there's parathyroid hormone in action, which will cause osteoclasts and reduce the formation of the bone, thereby reducing calcium from the bones and pushing them inside the blood. So always know the direction of the hormones, how they work and how their effect affects the bones or how the action affects the bones. So the calcitonin reduces bone resorption by fixing bones, uh, uh, calcium inside the bones and the teeth, making them stronger and healthier. Increases the deposit of calcium and phosphorus in the bones. So calcitonin will always increase. Once calcium moves, uh, definitely uh, the inside the bones, it will be stronger in the bones, it will be healthier, and there will be increased deposit. There will be increased deposit. Okay. It increases renal excretion of calcium and phosphorus. Once it's working to reduce blood calcium levels, there will be increased excretion because if it was low, the kidney would have retained calcium to raise the calcium levels in the blood. But once it is high and calcitonin levels come in, the calcitonin will increase excretion of calcium by kidneys producing more urine and the calcium will be lost through the urine. Okay, so once it goes, it goes along with phosphorus. So parathyroid will always pull calcium from the bones into the blood, while calcitonin always keeps calcium inside the bones, thereby reducing calcium levels. And the parathyroid will pull to increase uh, calcium levels. Calcitonin will keep the calcium inside the bones to reduce calcium levels. So parathyroid will increase calcitonin will decrease calcium levels. Know the actions appropriately. Parathyroid hormone will pull calcium out of the bones. Calcitonin will keep it there. So if there are two, look at the diagram below. The one on your extreme right is pulling and the other one is trying to restore it. So if this is the one in the bone on the left side, is trying to restore, uh, calcium inside the bone. So it's working the work of, or doing the work of calcitonin and keeping it there. And the one on my stream right is pulling it. That's doing the work of parathyroid hormone, pulling calcium from the bone to the blood. So the two of them are working opposite direction. That is calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Magnesium. 
the level magnesium levels lies within 1.5 to 2.5 milligram per deal. So that is the level here. Below 1.5 is hypomagnesemia, and above 2.5 is hypermagnesemia. Magnesium helps to maintain, so here that the function of the magnesium. It helps to maintain normal muscle and nervous activity, just like the calcium does, magnesium does the same thing. Magnesium also exerts effect on cardiovascular system, acting peripherally to produce vasodilatation. So you see the marks of they give to the pregnant woman when they experience preeclampsia and eclampsia. It's because of the effect of the magnesium causing the peripheral vasodilatation, thereby reducing peripheral resistance and allowing the blood to move without pressure building on the heart. So always magnesium has direct effect of causing peripheral vasodilatation. So you know the preeclampsia women are giving max off, max off, max off. And this is because of the effect of the magnesium uh, 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 on peripheral blood vessels causing vasodilatation and having a very, very good effect on the cardiovascular system. Though it has a direct effect on peripheral arteries and arterioles, it causes vasodilatation on them. So hypomagnesemia, any magnesium levels below 1.5 is calculated to be hypomagnesemia. So what are the causes of hypomagnesemia? A chronic alcoholism. Once you are drunk all the time, you boost, you take the hard liquid gene, it, it, it decreases the magnesium levels in the blood. Uh, it decreases. So once you take in these alcoholic beverages, you don't eat enough, you don't get magnesium sources from the food that you eat because you don't have the appetite to eat. And once even you take the alcohol, it prevents the absorption of magnesium from the food that you have taken. Just like you have taken food, good sources of calcium, and calcium is not going to be absorbed. So the same way magnesium is also not going to be absorbed when there's too much alcohol in the system. You, it prevents the reuptake and absorption of magnesium, thereby leading to hypomagnesemia. Diarrhea or any disruption in small bowel function. Here we have Crohn's disease, you have the colitis, you have the schist point disease. These conditions prevent reabsorption and there's diarrhea. So once the, there's diarrhea, the magnesium is not going to be absorbed, going to be excreted. So diarrhea conditions and disruption the small bowel function can also affect magnesium levels from being absorbed. Okay, so total parental nutrition. Uh, people who are having certain conditions, and it is said that those conditions can only be managed by going through total parental nutrition. The TPN there that you see is the total parental nutrition. Magnesium is not going to be absorbed. So they are going to experience hypomagnesemia, hypomagnesemia with total parental nutrition. And a typical example is diabetic ketoacidosis, diabetic KA. So once you experience DKA, you're going to have hypomagnesemia. So here, the causes, we can talk about reduced intake where you are not taking enough of calcium sources in your diet. So you take in unbalanced diet and the diet becomes depleted of calcium food sources that are having low levels of magnesium who affect magnesium levels in the, in the body. And impaired absorption, maybe you have malabsorption syndrome, gastrointestinal disease like Crohn's diseases, colitis, and so on and so forth. And you don't get magnesium being absorbed. And you have increased excretion. Maybe you have an alcoholism and legislative abuse. You always peg yourself and the stools become loose. It goes along with magnesium. And you have diuretics as depleting Potassium is depleting magnesium, depleting uh, uh, calcium. So anything that will deplete, cause laxative abuse and other things will cause low magnesium level. So these are the causes. Somebody sign this up. Okay. You put your hands up. We call you. Don't talk. Okay, let's hear you. Uh, so I normally want to 
let time then give you time to ask questions. But let's hear you. Yes. Okay. So, um, concerning the increased um, elimination. So in cases of um, you know, persons living with HIV are on ARVs, and then with the ARVs, I have read articles that um, it increased the elimination rate. So that elimination, mean that, elim elimination of um elimination of um food of what uh, el elimination of food like when they eat they make their elimination rate is increased uh -huh. elimination through stools or through the urine yeah through through stools and, through stools and okay so yeah. it means they will have low magnesium levels definitely Okay. Definitely, okay. yes. It's like a lessative, so definitely okay. to affect magnesium from being absorbed at the small and the large bowels. Okay. Okay. So thank you. All right. So let's look at the clinical manifestations. So we have, yes. Okay. Your hand is up. Okay. Let's go on. Uh -huh. Yes. Let's let's hear you. Let's hear you. Okay, so we have the neuromuscular irritability because magnesium helps in the nervous function and the nervous transmission. So when you have low magnesium, you have low uh, neuromuscular irritability. Then we have positive chivalric and threshold sign. We've talked about the chivalric sign uh, and that, uh, uh, and then the threshold sign. So all these signs are positive. We discuss it under the calcium levels. So ECG uh, changes with prolonged KRS interval. So with the calcium, we talk about prolonged QT intervals. With magnesium, there's prolonged KRS interval and a depressed ST segment. And there's also going to be cardiac dysrhythmias or arrhythmias. We said. Magnesium has a direct effect on the cardiovascular system. So during hypermagnesemia, the cardiac rhythms are going to be affected. Why would the cardiac rhythms be affected? Because it will affect the electrical conductivity of the heart. So it means that the heart is going to be uh, electrically uh, not functioning well because of low calcium levels. And it's once the ECG uh, uh, changes affect the heartbeat, it will def definitely going to be this rhythmic. So abnormal rhythms are going to be experienced because of low magnesium level. So you need good magnesium level for good electrical conduction and for good rhythmic contractions of the heart. Uh, hypermagnesium may occur with hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. So just note the three together. Once hypermagnesemia occurs, it goes along with hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. So the three behave the same. So during starvation, possible cause of hypermagnesia. If you are not eating, that is why we said total parental nutrition. Look at what this woman is doing, trying to model. And the modeling is causing her to lose magnesium because she doesn't want to put on weight. Look at her, her, her neck and look at her. She's just something like one. She's going to be a modeler. So she doesn't want to eat. She's going to experience hypomagnesemia. It's going to, the low magnesium levels are going to affect the seizures or the nerves. So it's going to experience seizures, tetany, anorexia, and arrhythmias. Rapid heartbeat because magnesium has a direct effect on cardiovascular system. Vomiting is going to be experienced. Emotional instability or liability. They said it gives you concentration and then mental stability. With low magnesium levels, there's going to be uh, emotionally uh, unstable. Deep tender reflexes increased. So deep tender reflexes are going to, because of the hyper nervous reactivity, there will be increased uh, reflexes in the, in the body. Hypermagnesemia, we have the medical nursing management, IV per oral magnesium replacement, including magnesium sulfate. So we can replace magnesium IV or oral, but we advise that you always go oral. So you don't move from hypo to 
hyper. Give calcium gluconate if accompanied by hypocalcemia. We said hypomagnesemia goes with hypocalcemia. And therefore, once you have hypocalcemia, you have hypomagnesemia. So once you are managing hypomagnesemia, then manage hypocalcemia as well by administering calcium gluconate per oral roots. Monitor for dys dysphagia. Give salt foods. So there's difficulty in swallowing because of the nervous irritability. Just like you are experiencing tetanus. In tetanus, the patient has difficulty in swallowing, so there's dysphagia. So the food should be soft, if possible, liquid, to aid the person swallow the food with ease. So me measure vital signs closely. That's monitoring of the vital signs periodically to monitor progress of the patient. So magnesium, high in magnesium, green leafy vegetables. If you go to the market, don't go to where you see the red meat, but branch to where you see green, 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 green vegetables. That is where life is. But we should then see you more at the meat section. Move to the vegetable section. And that is where there's life. Once you see green vegetables, you see magnesium in abundance. So hypermagnesemia, we have so much rich magnesium in the nuts. If you go to the malls, spend money to buy some nuts and take some nuts to enrich the body with magnesium. Legumes, legumes. Take enough legumes. We have so much magnesium in legumes and nuts. Seafoods. Seafoods are also rich in magnesium. So if you go through the vegetable roots in the market, pass through the fish side and buy some fish and get some calcium from the magnesium from the fish. Chocolate, at least spend some time once a week, once a month, spend some money, buy your own chocolate and take. Chocolate contains very high sources of magnesium. There are some people, they will never take chocolate unless Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day comes once every year. Why are you doing this to yourself? Take some amount of chocolate. Restore chocolate levels in the body. Hypermagnesemia. Serum magnesium levels greater than 2.5 milli equivalent per liter is described as hypermagnesemia. This is the bottle of magnesium. They are tablets. When you take, it can restore magnesium levels inside the body or the blood. Causes of hypermagnesemia is also seen in causes of potassium hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia. I've told you that three elements go through the same direction. So once you see the causes of hyperkalemia, you see the causes of hypermagnesemia and the cause of hypercalcemia. So here, we have renal failure. The renal failure, there's increased uh, 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 potassium levels as well as magnesium levels because the kidneys fail to excrete them. And the amount of magnesium and potassium keeps increasing uh, 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 in the blood. So that is what happens. Untreated diabetic ketoacidosis. If you don't treat DKA, definitely in DKA, as I told you, the glucose in the blood fails to enter the cells. So the cells advise themselves to go through glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And this action pushes potassium from inside the cell to the outside, causing hyperkalemia as well as hypermagnesemia. Magnesium goes through the same direction with potassium. So the activity that will push potassium from inside to outside the cell will rather also push magnesium also in, outside the cell, thereby increasing the levels of magnesium and calcium in the blood. Excessive use of antacids and laxatives. Excessive use of antacids and laxatives. So once you use antacids, antacid contain magnesium. So magnesium sulfate, like the one we have here, Philips, it has high sources of magnesium and is going to affect the magnesium levels in the body. Clinical manifestations, always the face looks flash, flash face and skin warmth in fair colored people. See the woman here, it's like she has stood under the sun for so 
uh, uh, long hours. So always the face is flushed with people having hypermagnesemia and there's mild hypotension, mild hypotension. So the BP drops because of the peripheral, high, uh, peripheral vasodilatation, it drops the BP because when the blood vessels are dilating, the BP drops. And that is the reason why it is given to patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia who are having increased blood pressure with re increased uh, peripheral resistance and they are having problems with the heart. So it is given to reduce the blood pressure and cause peripheral vasodilatation. Uh, hypomagnesemia. Uh, so here is supposed to be hypermagnesemia. Sorry. So there's heart block and cardiac arrest just behaving just like um, the potassium. So once we have hyper magnesemia, we have hyperkalemia, and this hyperkalemia causes heart block and cardiac arrest. So there is a mistake for the magnesium test. High, we are dealing with hypermagnesemia, not hypomagnesemia, so sorry for that. So muscle weakness and even paralysis mm -hmm. can also occur because it affects the nervous and muscle contractions. Let's see, in the renal, what happens at the renal level? Reflexes decreased plus weakness and paralysis. So here, we, there's more action on the reflexes and paralysis is going to be, because the nerves are going to be affected. ECG changes. So we are going to have bradycardia and hypertension because magnesium will definitely bring the heart activity under control and also cause hypertension. Nausea and vomiting is experienced. Appearance of flash face. I show you the picture of the woman with a flash face. Lethargy plus drowsiness and coma. Sometimes the patient can go into lethargy and coma. These are all experience with magnesium levels high. So happy magnesium or hypermagnesemia, medical management. We have to monitor the magnesium levels by doing blood electrolyte analysis, and the level shouldn't go above 2.5 milli equivalent per liter. Monitor respiratory rate. The rate, respiratory rate is supposed to be normal. The cardiac rhythm, you shouldn't see any arrhythmias or uh, uh, abnormal heartbeat. Increase fluids. So we need to increase fluids so that the kidney can take some of the magnesium out through urine formation and getting out of the body. IV calcium for emergence. Once you give IV calcium, once you give IV calcium, you are correcting magnesium, you are correcting potassium as well. So you can correct by the IV, but we always advise to go through the oral route. So you can prevent from hyper and that. So you give calcium because of the, uh, of the, of the activity on the heart. So calcium will definitely strengthen the heart muscle and the heart activity when there is weakness in the terms of rhythms. Okay. So phosphorus, Phosphorus may be our last element under discussion, phosphorus. So the normal serum phosphorus level is 2.5 to 4.5 milligram per deal. And it is essential to the function of the muscles and red blood cells, maintenance of acid-base balance and the nervous system. So they work the same. Always they work the same. So once you have good phosphorus, you have good muscle, contractions, you have good red blood cells production, you can maintain the acid-base balance and you have good nervous system. Phosphate levels vary inversely to calcium levels. So once you have high calcium levels, you have low phosphate levels. Once you have high phosphate levels, you have low calcium levels. So high calcium level, low phosphate. So calcium must inversely proportional to phosphate. Put this at the back of your mind. Always there's a reciprocal relationship between calcium and phosphate. So hypophosphatemia, serum phosphate levels less than
So serum phosphate levels less than 2.5 mL equivalent per liter. And this is described as So we have phosphor hypophosphatemia. So 2.5 mL per 0.5 mL equivalent per liter, it is described as the phosphate levels. If you go below this amount, it is less uh, uh, phosphate levels. So let's look at the causes of hypophosphatemia. Most causes likely to cause over serious intake or administration of simple carbohydrates. So this simple carbohydrate. So overzealous intake or administration of simple carbohydrate. So once you take too much, some people eat too much uh, intake or they take too much glucose. And look at the picture here. Severe protein calorie malnutrition, anorexia or alcoholism. So protein calorie malnutrition here, these are levels are going to affect phosphate levels. So over serious intake or administration of simple carbohydrates, you become bloated. Look at the person, obese, or severe protein calorie malnutrition, anorexia or alcoholism. Look at the person here on the right or the left side. It's like hypophosphatemia, clinical manifestations. You have muscle weakness, seizure, and coma because we need phosphorus for good nervous action to maintain muscles and other functions. Irritability, fatigue, confusion, and numbness are all seen with hypophosphatemia. So prevention, here we talk about the goal. The prevention is the goal. Don't allow the condition to set in, always prevent it. IV phosphorus for severe cases, prevention of infection, Infection is also very, very important. If you allow infection to set in, definitely it's going to cause the person not to be able to eat well. And if you're not able to eat well, it's going to affect your diet and the protein calorie malnutrition set in and this can cause low levels of phosphate. Monitor phosphorus levels always. Do blood electrolyte analysis and you can know whether phosphorus are low or high. Increased oral intake of phosphorus rich foods. So, if you have low phosphate, then the food sources of phosphate must be taken. So, rich phosphate uh, foods are milk and milk products. You see the cow there, you have the organ meat. So, the organs, the heart, the liver, the kidney, those organ meats contain high phosphorus levels. So, if you have low, you have to take in more of the organ meat. The nuts. The nut we saw in magnesium can also be taken. The fish, fish from the seas and from those fish that we take, we have high phosphorus levels. So take in food sources rich in uh, phosphorus, phosphorus. Poultry, poultry levels or chicken, they have good phosphate levels. Whole grain. Let's try to take whole grains. So once we take whole grain, there's always high going to increase the phosphate levels. So then we have hyperphosphatemia. If the same level is greater than 4.5 million equivalent, then the phosphate levels are high. And we are saying that phosphate levels are reciprocal to calcium levels. So once you have hyperphosphatemia, you have hypocalcemia. They go like that. And it is seen in renal failure. So here in renal failure, you have hyperphosphatemia. The phosphate levels are high. Chemotherapy. Those patients who are going through chemotherapy, their phosphate levels are going to be increased. And hypoparathyroidism. you are going to have hypoparathyroidism.
so we have chemotherapy and we have a uh, hypoparathyroidism so in hypoparathyroidism what you can explain to us how hypoparathyroidism can lead to this in hypoparathyroidism what happens uh huh mm -hmm. yes in relation to this, who can explain? Based upon the explanation I've given you before, hypoparathyroidism relation here. Who can explain for me to give some rewards, uh -huh, some handsome applaud? Yes, uh -huh. your name is? Yes, sir. My name is yes. Fidaus. Yes, Fidaus, eh? Uh, sir. Fidaus, very good. Uh, Fidaus. Uh, yeah. So previously, you did mention that uh, phosphorus is inversely proportional to uh, calcium. Sure. So, so if that is the case, um, 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 if, 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 if phosphorus is low, calcium is going to be high. So mm -hmm. in hypo, in hypo thyroidism, there is mm -hmm. going to be high, uh, high uh, calcium. Mm -hmm. In are you sure? Blood. Are you sure? Look, look at it yeah. very well. Yeah, parathyroid hormone is going to. Yeah, parathyroid hormone is responsible for you know uh, uh, bringing uh, pulling calcium from the bones into the bloodstream. So and when in hyperparathyroidism, would the parathyroid hormone be high or low? Pardon me, sir. No. In hyperparathyroidism, would the parathyroid have Hormone be high or low? It will be low. Very good. When it is low, what happens? It means that calcium is going to be high. So, sorry, calcium is going to be low. Fantastic. Calcium is going to be low. So when calcium is low, what's the reciprocal relation to uh phosphate? Phosphate will be high. That's mm -hmm. it. Yes. So thank you for the efforts. Thank you. So definitely, hypoparathyroidism will lead to low calcium absorption. And low calcium levels is a reciprocal relationship to phosphate. So there's going to be high phosphate levels. So during hypoparathyroidism, there's going to be hyperphosphatemia. That is the explanation. Thank you very much. High phosphate intake. If you take food sources with high phosphate level, you are going to increase the phosphate levels in the food. Clinical manifestations here. We have titany because phosphate, when it is the levels above normal, you are going to experience some sort of titany. Just behaving like the calcium because it is going to give you low calcium level. Mind you, hyperphosphatemia will give you low calcium level. Low calcium levels will give you titany. So once you are having hyper for fatemia, you are dealing with hypocalcemia, and then you experience signs of hypocalcemia, which is titany, muscle weakness, similar to hypocalcemia because of reciprocal relationship. I hope it's clear. So medical management, treat underlying cause. If there's any underlying cause like infection or any renal disorder, treat it so you can prevent and avoid it. Avoid phosphorus rich foods if it is the foods are high. Avoid those phosphorus rich foods so you can have levels of calcium coming to normal because high phosphate levels will give you low calcium levels, which has its own consequences. Okay, so uh, on this note, we bring electrolyte analysis to an end, but we have not finished. We have just uh, concluded on electrolyte analysis led with the other conditions to tackle. Any questions so far? Yes, any questions so far?
Yes. Somebody's hands are up. Yes, let's hear you. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Sir. Yes. Uh, please, there was somebody asked a question in the chat background concerning the calcium, calcium match of calcium in, into the, the bones that will cause the, the legs to be smaller. So the person asked the question relating to the difference between atrophy and then the calcium causing the leg so How are yeah. you going to know the difference? Yes, so... Please. You are not going to, what you are going to monitor is that once calcium leaves, that is going to lead to the atrophy. Look at the football players. Because of the exercise and the activity they do, look at their legs, the active legs. It's strong. If they are doing rugby, look at their shoulders. If they are doing basketball, look at their shoulders and then the upper arm is highly built because that is where the effort is always exerted. Once you have effort exerted on the muscles and then the bones, there is increased minerals, calcium, and other things that will keep the bone shape very well and develop the bone very, very well. Once the person is inactive and is bedridden, there is not no much activity in the bones and calcium and other minerals are going to leave the bone and make the bone atrophy and brittle, prone to fractures. So the fact that the person is not active will cause the release of thyroid hormone to pull minerals and calcium from the bones and make it more weaker and brittle. That is all. I don't know whatever explanation that you need again. Yes. 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 We are asking you to speak. If you don't speak, we move on. So intravenous infusions. So the next topic we are going to look at is intravenous infusions, which you do on the ward. We are going to look at what you do right, what you don't do right. Why do you pick this vein? Why you don't pick this vein? What infusion do you pick in an emergency and what are the reasons? So we are going to look at some basic principles underlying intravenous infusion. And this, we are going to end this and move on to a, another topic altogether. But if you don't do this, we haven't done or we haven't finished uh, electrolyte imbalance, where it is fluids, electrolyte imbalance, and intravenous infusion, they are together. So we need to look into this. So this course was initially designed for the emergency. So it was initially designed for the emergency medical attendant. If you move out to the United States and Europe, you have this profession, emergency medical attendants. And their work is to make sure that if you have emergency cases, they are there to save the situations. And once they train them, they give them the skill, the required skill they need, then they leave them to go to the field and work. Stable adult patient, 12 years of age or older, for purpose of this program, receiving intravenous fluids to keep a vein open or for fluid replacement during land ambulance transport. This includes stable patients who are receiving potassium chloride, thiamine or multivitamins and those patients who have established heparin or saline locks. So these patients may need different infusions at different times of their lives. And sometimes we decide to transport them in an emergency situation to another place to continue. While they are in the transit point, they need infusions and they need different electrolytes. The program will not train EMS in the care of patients whose intravenous therapy includes medications or blood products. So the course is not dealing with medications or blood products, only infusions, only infusions. And the program will not train EMS in the care of pediatrics. So we take the children away also from this. They are trained only to handle adults who have problems with fluids and electrolytes. Receiving or patient receiving tribunal therapy for any kind. Uh, we have these objectives here. 
uh, upon completion of this program for the routers that are designed, you are to define the difference between the arteries and then the vein. By the time you finish this, you should know the difference. List the common intravenous site use and explain the advantages and the disadvantages of each. So any intravenous site that you choose, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages? List the purpose of intravenous therapy, list the local signs, system, the systemic and the mechanical complications and their causes. During intravenous therapy, what are the local complications, systemic complications and mechanical complications, what caused them? Identify and demonstrate the use of the different types of intravenous equipment solutions. Administration says and heparin or saline locks how are we used or how are they used? Describe the importance of a safety technique when using IV equipment. Explain and demonstrate how to calculate the flow rate or the rate of flow ordered and to regulate the flow using the various intravenous sets. When you put infusions on, how do you calculate for the flow rate? How do you ensure that the doctor gave you four, two liters of infusions or four liters to run over 24 hours. How are you going to calculate the rate? Are you doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Describe the signs of infiltration or irritation at the IV insertion site. Describe the actions to be followed for infiltration at the IV insertion site and removal. Demonstrate the technique for changing the solution container. When infusing get finished on the world, what are the techniques to change them? Describe what should be checked when problems in adjusting the flow rates are encountered. Demonstrate the technique for fixing the needle or cannula using adhesive tips. When the doctor or the nurse in charge get the IV and the cannula is in situ, as a nurse, bring an adhesive or plaster that you are fumbling. How do you even apply it? Most of you are very skeptical in that direction. Describe the responsibilities of the EMA attendant before they are in and transport. That is the program designed for them. So uh, these are the objectives. Most of them you know already, you have already gone through them. So we wouldn't take much time to, we are just going to look at certain dimensions under every day where you'll be examined, properly examined. So please uh, take good care of them. But I gave you an assignment and the deadline was today. Uh, I hope you have submitted them through the, through the email I gave you. So if you have submitted them, that's fine. But if you have not submitted them, then the deadline is over, it's over. Okay, so okay, somebody is making uh, James or say. James Jose is saying that, sir, I think we need to cross-check the cause of hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. If I'm not mistaken, in both cases, there's hyperparathyroidism in the, is the cause. No, maybe you did not get it. For the hyperparathyroidism, we said uh, surgical hyperparathyroidism or primary hyperparathyroidism is not the same as hyperparathyroidism, okay? Uh-huh. So, in the primary hyperparathyroidism, something is inducing the hyperparathyroidism. In primary hyperparathyroidism, there is lack or deficient production of vitamin D. And when there is deficient production of vitamin D, calcium is going to be low. The low calcium levels is going to trigger, it's like a positive feedback mechanism. It's going to trigger the release or the trigger the parathyroid gland to produce parathyroid hormone. And it is at this point where parathyroid hormone is going to be, or the gland is going to overwork to produce more parathyroid hormone so that it will correct the hypocalcemia. 
So the idea here is the lack of the vitamin D. But the lack of vitamin D will lead to hypocalcemia. But how does the body respond to hypocalcemia? That is where it will trigger and stimulate the parathyroid gland to produce parathyroid hormone to correct the deficiency or the low calcium levels. And that is why we did not state directly as parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, but we said there's going to be secondary, uh, sorry, primary hyperparathyroidism and then surgical hyperparathyroidism. So these are the reasons. But for the direct hyperparathyroidism, the excessive production of parathyroid hormone will lead to excessive production of calcium by pulling calcium into the blood. But the hypocalcemia is different. Take it, take it clearly. It is not the same. Primary hyper and then surgical hyper is not the same as hyperparathyroidism. So please check the nose well. Okay. So that was an input from um, one of you. I think uh, that was an input from from James or say, James, that is an answer to your question. Okay, all right. Okay, so the background information about intravenous therapy. So uh, most of the time, when questions come from this area, students fumble because it deals with some aspect of calculations and they are not able to work well to get the answers right. And intravenous fluids are given for the purpose of providing nutrition. So we have reasons for giving IV infusions. Sometimes the patient is not able to put anything by mouth. The patient may be unconscious, cannot eat anything or swallow anything. So we, we resort to parenteral nutrition whereby we set the line and provide nutrition to the patients. So uh, the reason why we give uh, IV infusion is to sometimes provide the patient with correct nutrition. So we can give uh, the patient some sort of nutrients. So, and also restore loss fluids. The patient may be, may be dehydrated and you'll be called upon to restore the fluid and electrolyte levels. So you give, you set the line and give infusions. Vitamins and minerals, sometimes the patient may be a vitaminosis or they be experiencing going through some mineral deficiencies like lack of vitamin D, vitamin A, and so on and so forth. So you pick appropriate vitamins with appropriate infusions and put it on parenteral infused as infusions to get the patient to receive the normal levels of minerals and vitamins. Maintaining fluid balance during surgical and comatose conditions. So here you maintain fluid balance by during surgery, you have lost so much blood and therefore so much fluids. So the surgeon orders that put normal saline, blood expanders, put ringers lactate, let's get in the vitamins and the minerals, electrolytes he has lost, and let us expand the blood volume to prevent hypotension and to also prevent uh, the blood pressure from going down. So these instructions come from the surgeon and you put on the infusions to maintain the person hemodynamic values. And for administering medications directly into the circulatory system, sometimes you get the vein, not necessarily putting infusions, but to maintain the line for IV medications. So these are purposes for which we give intravenous fluid therapy. So if I ask you about the reasons and the purpose for uh, IV infusions, uh, please don't fumble, don't fumble at all. Okay. So the type and volume, the type and volume of the intravenous solution selected for administration is based on the fluid and electrolyte needs of the individual patients. Monitoring of a patient response to the fluid is being received is essential. Alteration to the volume administered and the composition of the IV solution are made following careful assessment of the patient's condition. The principal focus of IV administration is on maintenance and replacement. So if on the ward you are replacing fluids, you are either maintaining what the patient has so the patient doesn't create imbalance 
or you are replacing the lost fluids. So there are two major principal focus, either to maintain what the patient has or to replace the lost. So if you are setting up infusions, ask yourself, are you replacing or you are maintaining? Sometimes the patient condition calls for specific infusions and it is based on the patient condition. It is based on the patient appearance, what has been diagnosed, and that will inform you as to what infusions to pick. Even what line, what vein do you have to look for based upon the kind of infusions at hand, based upon the patient condition. I think a patient with extreme hypotension with reduced blood pressure, you not go and pick any smaller vein. You are going to pick a bigger vein so that you can replace a lot of infusions at every point in time and the patient may become stable within a short period of time. So sometimes the electrolytes and then the fluids we pick is based on the patient's condition at hand and the patient that is presented to us. You can't just, let me give you a typical example that happened at Kumase Mampontin Fade. Uh, 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 there's a village around Fade Junction called Abu Abuja. I shouldn't have mentioned the play, but I've mentioned it's no problem. There's a health center there. And the health center, something happened. Uh, a man who lives in the village, uh, I will not call that place a village because now Kumasi is around that place. There's a health center there and the man worked there with blood pressure monitoring. He worked by himself. When he got there, the PA wasn't there. If I say PA, the physician assistant wasn't there. So normally they work hand in hand with the midwife. So the midwife picked the man to just attend to him. And at the middle free department, they mostly uh, uh, deal with blood expanders because most of the women, when they come, they, they have lost fluids, they have lost blood, and they were tempted to expand the blood volume. So she knows normal saline as the infusion of choice anytime she has a case at hand. But at the OPD, when the case is not a maternity case and it's a, a general case, this woman, in the absence of the PA, looked at this man, checked on him. When he saw the man was too weak, he told the only infusion at hand is normal saline. Meanwhile, this man had come there with one a BP of 180 over 120. And this midwife picked a normal saline infusion, an infusion on this patient with a BP of 180, 120, and ran the normal saline in addition. A patient who has walked to the facility by himself ended up becoming paralyzed because at that time the infusion had expanded the blood volume and it has caused the rupture of some of the uh, vessels in the brain. This patient had developed CVA because of the excessive expansion of the blood pressure. And this man couldn't walk back home because of what happened. This happened at a certain health center and it was not easy at all. So sometimes the patient at hand, the case we have, the condition the patient has brought in will inform you as to pick which of the infusions and which line do you pick to maintain the patient? Are you replacing or you are maintaining? So if you are maintaining, then the maintenance therapy involves the provision of fluids, electrolytes, nutrients, so the patient is on the ward, but you don't want him to lose fluids as well as electrolytes. You don't want the patient to lose nutrients and vitamins. So you are replacing nutrients, you are replacing vitamins according to the needs of the individual patients. The goal of IV administration is to establish or maintain a state of fluid equilibrium in the patient. Always, we are looking at how do we maintain equilibrium so we don't go hypo or hyper. In my analysis, we do DM electrolyte imbalance. I always make sure that be careful not to move from hyper to hypo or not to move from hypo to hyper. The body is trying to always maintain equilibrium. So that is for the maintenance dose. If you are replacing, then there has been an imbalance and therefore you are replacing to cause a balance. 
So replacement therapy involves providing the components lost due to surgery. So you might have taken through the surgical procedure and through the surgery, you have lost a lot of blood. So the blood volume is low, the HB has run low, and the doctor is trying to expand the blood volume to maintain hemodynamic values. During trauma like RTA, you might be bleeding excessively. During burns, you may be going through dehydration and shock. And all these will require that the blood volume is low and therefore you need to replace. Do you have any diarrhea and vomiting, tubular drainage, wound and burn drainage and diuresis? All takes so much fluids away from you and you'll be tempted to replace the lost fluids. So relevant anatomy here, those that we need to discuss, uh, you learned this uh, from the diploma level. We have functions of the arteries and the veins. All arteries carry blood away from the heart. The blood that moves through the arteries come with high pressure. And always the pressure uh, causes uh, the blood to move with certain kind of force. Uh, and the blood, the, 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 the blood is bright red and uh, is high under high pressure. That is uh, the nature of arterial blood and then the blood uh, vessels. Now, you look at the veins. And the veins, on the other hand, has a, a steady stream. The pressure is relatively low. And the color of the blood in the arteries is just uh, dark brown. It's not as bright as the arteries. And the venous blood uh, comes with some kind of under pressure, under pressure. And all these are the nature that tells you where the, the type of vein or artery the blood is coming from. And we know arteries or veins have a characteristic nature. We have three major layers. The innermost layer of the artery is called the tunica intima. The middle is the tunica media and the outer tunica adventitia. The tunica media is made up of uh, uh, muscles that, that have elastic uh, fibers. And this elastic fiber is made up of protein called elastin. And this elastin has the ability to stretch. And that is when blood pumps, that elastin helps the middle layer to stretch out so the blood vessels can expand by the help of the elastin. That's making sure that the pressure within which the blood is coming doesn't go back to the heart, but the arteries dilate to absorb the pressure and thereby maintaining a normal blood pressure within the veins and then the arteries. If you lose the elastin, the ability for the blood vessels to stretch, then it means the blood or the vessel has become a, a, a thick and the elastin has been lost. So when the heart pumps blood and they come in with under pressure, the pressure is felt on the heart. And that is where the heart always experiences high blood pressure during arterial and arterial sclerosis. The elastin is lost and the multi layer doesn't expand with much ability to absorb the pressure. And therefore the pressure goes back to the heart. The capillaries we know connecting the arteries to the veins and it has a mixture of both venous blood and arterial blood. Uh, it supplies nutrients to the cells as well as oxygen and send waste product to the veins at the venous end. Okay, so the veins, I've talked about the veins. Common intravenous site, here we have the uh, anticubital fossa that is we look at it, looking at the elbow, in front of the elbow lies the anticubital fossa. The veins involved are the metacarpal veins, the cephalic vein, the basilic vein. We, at the hospital, we know where these veins are found. And we can choose one of these veins for intravenous infusions. Hospital staff select veins based on how visible the vein is. I don't think any nurse will select a vein that is not visible. Even when they see the vein, they make sure that it is quite long 
so it can accommodate the cannula. If the vein is short, they will not even select a particular vein. So hospital staff or nurse select veins based on how visible the vein is, how stable the vein will be after insertion so that it doesn't get confused within a short time. So would the vein remain stable and visible so it doesn't cause interstitia? We are going to learn some terms very soon. Does the area remain relatively still naturally or with a splint? The part you have chosen to insert the, the cannula or the vein or the, put the IV infusions, will you need a splint or the part will remain relatively still even when the patient is lying without causing interstitia or without causing the vein, the needle to slip out of the vein? If the place is not stable, that is where you apply the splint. If the vein is stable, then you don't need to apply a splint. Okay, so uh, and consideration for patient IV side as the care of the patient progresses. So as you care and you give the patient infusions. Are you going to splint or hold the hand so the infusion get finished? The location of common veins used in IV therapy are shown in the following. So we had some diagrams. So these are the times giving you tunica intima, tunica media, tunica adventitia. That is the layers I've talked about already. Equipment and supplies. We have needles and cannula. Before you can give infusion to a patient, you need certain equipment and supplies. Needles and cannula are needed. Adhesives, here you people call it plaster, but over there we call it adhesives. And adhesives, we have different types. Some react to the plaster, others don't react to the plaster. Those who react to the plaster, we give a paper one so the body doesn't react to it. Most needles are made of stainless steel, while cannulas are made of plastics. I hope you have seen one before. I think next week I will have to bring a lot of these uh, items to show you as an example, even though some of you are working at the hospital, most of you have not been sent to the hospital yet to study their uh, 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 clinical work. So we have to demonstrate them for them to see because it's possible in the uh, diploma level, these explanations were not down there well for them. So the reason why you are doing degree, we need to explain them to you well. Plastic cannulas are coated with a material that assists in reducing clot formation on the catheter. So uh, the stainless steel, we, uh, it is made up of, the needles are made up of stainless steel. So the needle that you see is a stainless steel needle. Stainless steel means it doesn't cause, uh, it, uh, it doesn't rust. There's no rusting even when it is inside the veins. And the plastic ones, they are made up of plastics. But even though they are made up of plastic, it, the plastics are coated. The cannula is coated so that clots doesn't form around the catheter. The catheter is the cannula. So the cannula we mentioned, they call it catheter. So once it's inside, the rubber is inside the vein, there's no clot formation because of the material they have used to coat around the catheter. Plastic cannulas are produced with a, a stainless steel truck. Hey, 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 hey. Plastic cannulas are produced with a stainless steel truck trucker core, which is used to provide ease of insertion. The trucker is removed from the lumen of the cannula following the insertion into the vein. So if you look at a cannula, there's always a slim needle which is inside. That needle is always ahead of the rubber cannula. It's the tip of the needle that pierces the skin and allows the whole cannula to enter the vein. Once you enter the vein, then you see it, you are in the vein, they remove the trucker core. So the trucker core that you remove, that slim needle is called the steel trucker core. It is removed upon the insertion of the cannula, so the blood can move through the cannula through the vein. So I will demonstrate this to you next week when I come with them. Most plastic cannula are made so that x-rays will not pass through. 
This is essential for verification of placement and location in case the catheter is lost in the patient. Plastics are best for long-term therapy when veins are few in number and to assure that a vein will remain open. Stainless steel needles are coated with silicone, uh, which prevents corrosion, facilitates ease of insertion, and retards thrombi formation. Okay, so what we are saying here is that if you use plastic cannulas, sometimes you may be ha handling a child, and the child that you are handling may be struggling with you when you are looking for the vein. In the course of you trying to get the vein, the tip of the cannula can be broken into the vein. It happens all the time, but probably you have not taken notice of it. So when the tip of the cannula enters into the vein, then it goes through the vein and moves into circulation. It can cause embolism and kill the patient. So when you identify that the plaster tip of the cannula has been broken, then this material is made in such a way that you expose the site to X-ray. So during X-ray, because the cannula, the rubber has been made to stop the X-ray, the X-ray is taken and you will see a shadow telling you the location of the broken tip of the cannula. So you can go through that through surgery and remove it. So it doesn't go through circulation to cause embolism. So always the rubber cannula tips where the needle is inserted, those tips are made up of a special material that stop X-rays so that in case of any uh, uh, piece broken into circulation, we can expose the body to X-ray and we can know the location of the, uh, or the, or the plastic and remove it. And we are saying that if you are giving a long-term intravenous infusion, then the best thing that you should do is to take a cannula, which is plastic. So it does not get tissue or interstitia or slip out of the vein with ease and it will remain there and become stable for a long time. And even when the veins are not many, and you have struggled to get a very good vein, then it is possible that you use a cannula to maintain that vein. So you don't destroy that vein because the veins are not many in numbers. Okay, now the stainless steel, which is the needle itself, those that use direct needle, they are called stainless steel. That particular uh, needle, which is slippery, is coated with silicone. Silicone. And once it's coated with silicone, it prevents the needle from getting corroded or corrosion. So it doesn't get rusted. And the silicone facilitates ease of insertion and also reduces the possibility of thrombi formation. So the stainless steel needle that you see, when it is slippery because of the silicone material that has been coated, and it, 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 it retards thrombi formation and also prevents corrosion when you use the stainless steel needle. So uh, stainless steel needle cannot be used for long-term intermittent therapy. It can be used for only short-term intermittent therapy short-term intermittent therapy. Okay. So short in, when you are given infusion for a short-term therapy, it, you can use the stainless steel needle, but in the long-term therapy, you can use the plastic cannulas. But some staff prefer the stainless steel needle to cannula because the cannula, you need a skillful person, a very good person to insert the cannula. But with the needle, any other person with a straight vein can just fix it there. But with the cannula, you need a skillful person. Studies show a greater incidence of site infection with plastics, saying there is a greater incidence of fungal overgrowth. Trauma to the vein is less severe with stainless steel, since the needle gauge is smaller and the material is smoother. However, there is more risk of vein puncture with movement of the needle or steel, steel needles. We are saying that uh, uh, studies and observation have shown yes. that once you fix the cannula, there is the higher or greater incidence of fungal overgrowth because it will be there for a long time. So if you are not careful, the cannula or the plastics always have greater incidence of infection because of the high possibility of fungal overgrowth. But uh, once you, you, you use the cannula, 
you also give too much traumatic experience to the person because of the size and the cannula all going to enter the vein. So trauma to the vein is greater in cannula than in the stainless steel. So we are saying that trauma to the vein is less severe with stainless steel since the nodal gate is smaller and the material is smoother. So the nodal is smaller and smoother than the cannula. So trauma is severe in the cannula and less severe in the stainless steel. However, if you use the stainless steel, you can puncture the nodal several times. The patient will call you, my menace. The vein is, uh, is stitch is swollen. Please come because the needle will always pierce the side and the infusion will leak into the interstitial space and you'll be called upon to re insert it. So the scalp vein or the butterfly needle is more often preferred to a straight needle because. It is easier to insert. So sometimes when you use, or uh, when you have a patient with irregular veins, sometimes the vein is not straight, you have a very short vein. The private hospitals are very good in using a needle called butterfly needle. You have seen one before. I will, I will bring one for you to see next week. Butterfly needle, it is short, but very effective. You can fix it anywhere and you are okay to go. The butterfly needle is used by most of the private hospitals and it's easier to insert than the other needle because any short vein, you can face it there and you can connect it to the uh, given set. So uh, we have gauges and size of the needles, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24 gauge. But the gauge of the needle, the, the smaller the size of the needle, the bigger the gauge. And the bigger the gate, the smaller the size. What does that mean? If you pick a needle and they have written on the needle uh, size 14, it means that the gauge is big, the lumen is bigger. If you pick a needle and they have written size 24, it means that the needle is very, very small. So the size and the gauge are reciprocal or have reciprocal relation. So look at it very, very well. Needle gate refers to the lumen of the needle. The higher the number, the smaller the diameter. I don't know, some people will talk, you meet them and they will meet themselves and still cause disturbance in the class. So uh, we want to end here at heparin and saline locks. Next week, I'll continue from heparin and saline locks. Uh, and then I think we will finish this therapy by next week, God's willing. So I will show you and demonstrate to you some of these things. A lot of you have seen it, others haven't. And then we can conclude on this and move on to another topic, God's willing. Huh? Yeah, somebody is asking. Somebody is asking whether whether the huh? butterfly needle is made up of stainless steel. Yes, of course, the butterfly needle is made up of stainless steel because it is made up of stainless steel, but you have to remove it from the rubber cannula. You don't insert together with the rubber cannula and the cannula. So the butterfly needle is made up of stainless steel, but we have to remove it from a small rubber cannula. So it is made up of stainless steel, but it is short. Okay, so. Uh, somebody was asking, why are the general nurses? They decided not to talk. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. You said, sir, your teaching is nice. Thank you very, very, very much. Okay, any question from Fun the class? Again. Any question from the class? Any question, contributions? So far, we are about to end infusions or fluid electrolyte therapy, and we move on to a major topic. A good question.